Good morning. Today's reading is from Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and she saw that he was a fine child, and she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river. As his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him, now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought for him to excuse me, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. Well, good morning. We're, uh, we're beginning a new series of, of messages today um, on the life of Moses. And we're, gonna, we're not going to study the entire book of Exodus. Uh, in fact, there will be a couple of messages where we're, we're actually looking in, in a couple of other books uh, besides Exodus. But our, our purpose here is not so much to, to do an exhaustive study on the life of Moses or even just to get to know Moses better, but it's really... To, to see how God has saved his people. And I think that as we see how God saved and delivered his people Israel, we will learn uh, more and more, hopefully, about the way that God has delivered us as well, because we are among God's people, even, even as we, we learn how God saved his people Israel. So we'll, we'll do this for probably the better part of three months. It'll take us up pretty close to, to Christmas time. Um, so I hope that this will be a, an encouraging study in God's Word. I, I'm, I'm very excited about it, and I, and I hope that it will be helpful to you. As New Testament Christians, I think it's, it's easy or natural for us to, to really focus more on the New Testament than the Old, because we're, you know, we, we believe in the things that took place in the New Testament, and we feel like the things that happened in the New Testament are really the fulfillment of the things that were foretold in the Old, and that's true. But I think there's so much that we can learn from the Old Testament. In a sense, if, if you think about it, is, is an oak tree more complete than an acorn? It may be more complete in the sense that everything has unfolded more fully, but everything that's present in the oak tree was also present in the acorn. And I think in a lot of ways, that's the way the Old Testament is, that everything that is present in the New Testament for us as Christians was present in the old. It just hadn't been fully unfolded for us yet. And so, so I hope that, that we will gain some perspective and be encouraged as we, as we study some of the things that happened as God dealt with his people in the Older Testament. The point is that we need both. We need the whole counsel of the scriptures. And so we've spent, so since we've spent most of our time here recently in the in New Testament passages, I um, thought it would be helpful for, for us to focus some time in the old. The Israelites have come to this place where they are living in Egypt. And as we, as you probably know intuitively, many of you are familiar with the book of Exodus, you know that, that when, when the book of Exodus opens, the nation of Israel is in a place of bondage. They're slaves in Egypt. They had come to Egypt because Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, had become the second in command under Pharaoh of all of the land of Egypt. Now, the way that, that Joseph came to that place was, was not a, a very pleasant journey for Joseph. Uh, most of you recall that Joseph 
uh, being one of two of the 12 brothers uh, among the, the sons of Jacob who had a different mother. J um, Joseph and Benjamin had a different mother than the other 10 brothers. And so the other 10 brothers did not treat Joseph very kindly. It didn't help that Joseph was sort of arrogant. He was a little unusual, but they didn't treat him well, and they sold him literally into slavery. And so Joseph had a very difficult journey, but Joseph eventually found his way into Egypt where Pharaoh recognized the gifts that God had given him and, and gave him a great charge of responsibility and authority in the land of Egypt. And so when a famine came into the homeland of, of Jacob and his children, there was food in Egypt. And so they decided to go to Egypt and see if they could take advantage of the food supplies that were there. And when they arrived in Egypt, Joseph recognized them. And rather than retaliate against his brothers who sold him into bondage, he said, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. And so he welcomed them. And, and because they were Joseph's family and Joseph had favor in the eyes of Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, hey, your family's my family. And so he allowed Joseph's family, the people that we know now as the Israelites, to come in and find a home and find safety and find provision in the land of, e of Egypt. But since that time, Joseph and all his brothers have died. And so now, I'm going to pick up here back in, in chapter 1 of Exodus, beginning at verse 8. And now things are different. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, the Egyptians, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if a war breaks out, they would join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Raamses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad." And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. And in all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. So that's where, that's where we're, we're coming to. In the passage that Mindy read for us, this is the backdrop for that. And so not only are the Israelites now forced into labor as slaves. But Pharaoh has another idea up his sleeve. And so let me just continue reading a couple more verses here, verses 15 and 16. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you serve as a midwife for the Hebrew women and you see them on the birth stool, if it's a son, you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, she may live. So at this time in history, infanticide was not that rare. In, in the primitive pagan cultures, infanticide, infanticide was, was not unusual because the people did not really have that high a view of human life. Everything was, was strategic. Everything was means to an end. However, it was most often associated, infanticide was, it was often, most often associated with the taking of the lives of female infants. But in this case, this decree is given with regard to the male children. It seems that Pharaoh was trying to accomplish one of, of two things. Either he was trying to eliminate the entire Hebrew race by, by essentially terminating and, 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 and saying from this point on there will be no more male Hebrew children born and then thinking that he could probably work the, the, other, the adult males to death in slave labor and then the women of Israel could just be assimilated into the Egyptian culture through marriage. That, that's one theory that, that many have, have considered or speculated that that's what Pharaoh was trying to do. Another theory is that he was simply trying to control their population. 
that he was temporarily for a particular season of time going to be killing all of the newborn male children among the Hebrews, therefore sort of creating down the road this, this season where, where the population of the Hebrews would not be growing and it would be reducing by attrition and then he could just kind of control the population. We're not really sure exactly what his motivations were. Um, it doesn't really tell us. Uh, when I've read it, I initially kind of thought it was the first, that it was, that it was Pharaoh trying to just get rid of the Hebrews. But we know that later on, when the Hebrews do leave Egypt, we know that Pharaoh will have second thoughts, and he will, re- he will regret that this labor force has left the country, and he goes back and wants to bring them back. So I'm not entirely sure that he really just wants to eliminate them. Perhaps he's just trying to control the growth of their population. But, but the bottom line is that, that this is a terrible decree, that obviously the Israelites are, are in, a, in an oppressed position. They're in bondage to this slavery. And so Pharaoh has, has made this incredible decree that, that understandably would have the Israelites in fear. But the next thing that we're confronted with are two examples of civil disobedience. The first of which comes at the hands of the Hebrew midwives. Now, I'm not exactly sure if these midwives are Hebrew women and are serving as midwives to the other Hebrew mothers, or if they are Egyptian women who just happen to be assigned to serve as midwives for the Hebrew women. But but regardless, we're told that these Hebrew women, I'm I'm sorry, these Hebrew midwives have at least spent time with the Israelites, and, and, and the Scripture says that they feared God. And so, instead of carrying out this order from Pharaoh to kill the male infants born to these Hebrew women, they don't kill them. They let them live. And when they're confronted about this, by Pharaoh or by some representative of Pharaoh, their answer is, well, you know, these Hebrew women are more vigorous than the Egyptian women, and when we come to perform our midwifing responsibilities, they've already delivered the children. And presumably, therefore, there's no opportunity to take the child and end its life. Well, Pharaoh's not very happy about this. It says that Pharaoh dealt with them doesn't exactly say how he dealt with them. It would appear that he did not kill them because we also read that God honored their actions as faithfulness. And he blessed these midwives by giving them families of their own. And so we have this disobedience to to what is happening here, and God seems to be honoring it. However, after this, Pharaoh gives an even broader decree, and he tells all of the Egyptian people that that any male child born to the Hebrews is to be drowned in the Nile River, and he's basically commissioned every Egyptian citizen with the authority to enforce the decree. Imagine that. You're, You're an Israelite. You're living in the land of Egypt as as slaves, and every citizen of Egypt has now been empowered to take any male child born among the Hebrews and take them and drown them in the Nile River. That's, That's where they're living now. And this, this is what brings us to our text this morning, the text that Mindy read for us. Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Because at this, into this context, there's a Hebrew couple that has a, a baby boy. And the boy survives labor and delivery, and the, the baby is starting to grow. But it's becoming harder and harder for this family to keep the existence of this little baby a secret. They can't keep him quiet, and they can't, can't, they can't keep it a secret. And so, very famously, this is perhaps one of the most famous stories in all of the Old Testament. 
the mother creates a vessel. We call it a basket, you know, because it was made out of the things that you make a basket, but it was more than just a basket. It was lined with pitch. It was essentially waterproof. And she puts this baby into this vessel and sends it down the Nile River. And then down the river, there are some of the daughters of Pharaoh who are coming down and bathing, and we don't know if they're bathing in the sense of taking a bath or if they're just enjoying the river, but they're down there, and they discover, they come upon this basket with this baby inside. Now, I have to tell you, as I have, have read this passage of Scripture through most of my Christian life, I have had a tendency to think that these are just random events, that, you know, I don't know what possessed this Hebrew mother to do this, but she, doesn't, she does, obviously doesn't want her child to die. And so she puts him in a basket, sends him down the river. Maybe she's thinking, technically, I'm fulfilling the decree. It says that they had to be thrown in the river, and so I'm putting him in the river. I don't know. But I'm thinking, this is just sort of random. Why would someone do this? And then it goes down the river, and there just happened to be some people down there, and they find him. Well, guess what? I don't think it's random. The more I study this passage and the more I see the hand of God at work, I don't think this is random. I think the mother and the parents of Moses made a plan, and the plan worked perfectly. They made this basket, they put the baby in it, they went to a place on the river that they knew was just upstream from where the daughters of Pharaoh would come to bathe, and they put the baby there and they sent it down the river. And then they sent their older daughter into the reeds, you watch, you pay attention, you see what happens. And so when one particular daughter of Pharaoh comes out, and by the way, Pharaoh has lots of daughters. Pharaoh had lots of wives. Pharaoh had lots of concubines. Pharaoh had lots of children. So he had lots of daughters. But one particular daughter of Pharaoh comes and discovers this baby. And she says... This must be one of the Hebrew babies. And so Moses' older sister approaches this woman and says, Would you like for me to get one of the Hebrew women to nurse this child for you? And you can start to see the wheels turning in this daughter of Pharaoh because she says, Do as you've said. Take the child, nurse the child. I'll pay, you my, I'll pay you wages to do it. And so you can tell that she's thinking, I'm going to take this baby and I'm going to raise it as my own son. Here's what's, what's interesting. Most scholars believe that for the next four to six years, Moses was in regular contact with his natural, biological Jewish parents. Why? Because in ancient civilizations, when you didn't have formula and other kinds of baby food, nursing took place for anywhere from three to six years. That was a normal thing. And so you have this situation here where Moses is, is in regular contact with his Jewish heritage, but he is also raised by a daughter of Pharaoh and educated in the Egyptian culture. And this brings me just real quickly to two, two quick observations. One, if Moses was raised for the first four to six years of his life with regular exposure to his native Hebrew culture, that's essential for him to be, in the future, the deliverer of his people. Because not only does he have a genetic bond with them, but he has enough of a familiarity with them that he knows that he's one of them. But at the same time, by, by the way, let me just say this. Some of you have seen Disney's uh, you know, version of this story, The Prince of Egypt. And if you haven't, I, I'd certainly encourage you to go see it because I think it's a, it's a helpful 
you know, it's, it's sort of a mainstream way of telling the story of Moses. But it's interesting, as Disney tells the story, they would, would have you believe that Moses has no recollection of his connection to the Israelite people, that he becomes an adult and he just starts seeing things and, and he, doesn't, he doesn't understand who he is in light of this. The Scripture seems to say something different. The Scripture, I think, seems to indicate that Moses very much has an awareness of his Jewishness, even while living in Pharaoh's household. But the second observation is that having, having been raised and, and being aware of his Hebrew heritage, these circumstances also allowed Moses to be among the most highly educated people in the world. Egypt was one of the most sophisticated cultures in the world at that time. And Moses was the beneficiary of that, something that he never would have had. Even though he would have lived in Egypt, he never would have received this kind of education and preparation as a slave among the oppressed Jewish people. Moses would not have been prepared to be the deliverer of God's people the way that he was unless both of these things had happened. And they both did happen. The rest of the story goes like this. Continuing at verse 11, I know I, know I only had Mindy read up to verse 10, but, but just continuing because I'm trying to give you a sense of what's happening in all of chapters 1 and 2 sort of as a, an overview here as we begin. But in verse 11, we read that one day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and he looked on their burdens. He knows them. He knows who they are and he knows who he is. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. Like Moses, like, like Joseph, Moses had two people. He was of two people. He was of the Hebrews, but he was also of the Egyptians. What, what made it sort of easy for Joseph is that during Joseph's experience of being of two people, the Egyptians and the Hebrews had a good relationship. They were, they were friendly toward each other. But now that's different. The Hebrews and the Egyptians are not friends. One is an oppressive culture holding the other group in bondage and slavery. Moses has to realize that someday he's going to have to make a decision. He's going to have to choose with whom, with which of these people will he identify. And so that decision is now upon him. Continuing in verse 12, he looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian. I love the way this is phrased here. And he hid him in the sand. He buried him. He buried him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, Moses did, why do you strike your companion? And they answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you, do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? And now, now Moses knows he has a problem. Moses then was afraid, and he thought, surely this thing has become known. This thing that I've done yesterday to the Egyptian has become known. When Pharaoh heard of it, sure enough, Pharaoh sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian and sat down there by a well. Now, in the grand scheme of things, Moses has made the right choice. Right? I mean, to, be, to choose to be identified with his Hebrew people is a right choice. But he has now drawn attention to this choice by abusing his authority. You see, if, if a grandson of, of Pharaoh had lost his temper and killed a slave, the Egyptians probably would be willing to look the other way. Maybe he'd be reprimanded for his temper. You know, look, you're going to be your grandson of Pharaoh. You're going to have to control your temper, temper a little better than this. 
But in this case, he has not killed a slave. He's killed another Egyptian. And therefore, this is a crime against Egypt. But on top of this, because Moses was raised in his early years among the Hebrew people, I think most of the Hebrews know who he is. You might think, well, no, this is a secret. Well, no, he, he, if he spent the first four to six years of his life being raised among the, a Hebrew family and therefore among the Hebrew people, the word about who Moses is has had to have gotten out. Now, they're not, I don't think they're willing to out him. I don't think they're willing to blow his cover. But if they know who he is, there's bound to be some resentment. He is the only Hebrew in the whole nation of Egypt that is not living like a slave. And so you see it, you hear it in the way that they respond to him. And as a result, he's, his predicament is like this. He's got a couple things going on. First of all, he lacks credibility with the Hebrew people. They don't know if they can trust him. Secondly, he has lost credibility with Pharaoh. He's now a marked person. Pharaoh has basically put out a decree or an order that Moses be killed. And so he flees to a place in the desert called Midian. And that's where we leave him today. We'll come back next week and we'll pick up where we're leaving him off. But he is sitting down beside a, a well in the middle of the wilderness. And he could very easily, try to put yourself in, in Moses' position at this point, very easily we could be thinking, his life is over. His career is over. Everything that he has been preparing for his whole life is now gone. So we're going to pick up Moses here next week, but before we leave off here, I just want to press in a little bit with us on, so what do we learn? What do we see here? There's probably many things that we could see, but there's, there's two takeaways that I want to try to draw out for us that we can see and, and hopefully uh, draw some application for our own lives. The first is this. There is a biblical basis for civil disobedience. I think that's a sort of relevant topic for us where we live today, and I think we see it in the text. Both the midwives and Moses' mother knowingly broke the law of Egypt. And it appears that God honored it as faith. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul exhorts his readers to obey the earthly authorities, to obey the worldly government. But notice why Paul gives this instruction. What his explanation is, he says, because God's authority is behind it. Obey the earthly governments, obey the civil magistrate because God has put the civil government in place. And so you see what Paul is actually calling us to is obedience to the Lord. That, that's what Paul is calling us to. He's saying obey God and because earthly authorities have been put in place by God, then we should obey worldly authorities. But I think what's important for us to see is that one authority derives its authority from the other. You see, the worldly government's authority comes or it derives from the authority of God. The reason this is important is because if at any time the worldly authority is in conflict with God's authority, well, then whose authority do you go with? We go with God's authority. God's authority is supreme. And so here's, here's the principle that I think is taught in Scripture. We, we, we see it lived out here in Exodus, and we hear it taught as a principle in the New Testament. And that is that we are called to obey earthly authority unless 
the worldly authority commands what God forbids, which is essentially what we're seeing here. The earthly authority is commanding the murder of these children, and God's authority says, don't murder. Or, unless the worldly authority forbids what God's authority commands, which is part of what we see when we read the book of Daniel. When the the worldly authority, the king of Babylon says, no one shall pray to or bow down to anyone but the king, Daniel says, you're forbidding me to do something that my God commands, and that is that I worship him. And so Daniel worships God. That's civil disobedience. Now let me say this. This is important, I think. When we think about civil disobedience, the the emphasis is primarily on disobedience, not on protest. You see, what happens here is the Pharaoh gives a decree. The women, the, women, the, he, the Hebrew midwives or even, even the Jews, they don't, they don't strike up a protest and have a riot. They just say, you've given us a command that I cannot obey. And so they don't. Those are different. See, disobedience says, I recognize your authority because God has put you there but you're giving me a command or you're, you're forbidding me from doing something that I must do because I fear God. So it's not a throwing off of that authority. It's just a disobedience to a particular thing because I'm going to obey God, not men. It's different from a riot or even a protest. I think that's important. I think it's also important to to recognize here that that what's happening in this civil civil disobedience is there is a there is a God's eye view that is present. And what I mean by a God's eye view is what I'm saying is it's not just that I look at I'm a human being and you're a human being and we look at this as human beings and we just do what comes naturally to human beings. It's the perspective to recognize that God is doing something that is bigger than us. And ultimately, my protest may ultimately be against God. It may not be a participation in what God is doing. I think in many ways, we as Christians are never going to be at home with what we would call human authority, earthly authority, worldly government. When societies say that authority rests with the government, as Christians, we tend to say, well, no, actually, authority rests with God. And human government only has authority because God gives it to them. And then there are other times when societies say that authority essentially rests with the individual, which, by the way, is the culture, kind of culture that we have lived in for most of our lives. Because in most Western cultures, and particularly in America for the last two to three hundred years, if you think about it, the primary authority, according to our Constitution, rests with the individual. It's the freedom of the individual, it's the rights of the individual that are supreme. And as Christians, Even though we say the United States has largely been a Christian nation, as Christians, we really ought to say, actually, authority doesn't rest with individuals. It rests with God. So you can see, depending on the government, depending on the context, depending on the situation, Christians can sometimes be viewed as conservative. When the the government is on the side of God's law, when when, when the, the government, the human government is saying something in line with what God says, well, then Christians tend to be conservative. We say, yeah, we need to follow the law. We need to do what the government is saying. But if the government is doing something very different than what God's law says, well, all of a sudden, Christians become very liberal because Christians are saying, no, we're going to follow God, not this, not this government. The question or the questions 
for civil disobedience are what, I'm sorry, does worldly authority require of me what God forbids? And does worldly authority forbid me to do what God requires? This question came up for us a few months ago, didn't it? Because the civil government, the local worldly government said that we could not gather for worship. Right? The scripture says, don't forsake gathering together. That's Hebrews 10, 25. And so you have the government saying, you may not gather for worship, and you have the Word of God saying, don't forsake gathering together for worship. So some Christians felt that that was an appropriate occasion to engage in civil disobedience. Our elders wrestled with this. This was a hard discussion. What we decided was that we didn't believe that we were being told that we could not worship. Instead, we believed that we were being told to do something temporarily, to abstain from gathering in an effort to participate in a bigger effort in our community to try to limit the spread of a virus. And so we agreed to participate in something that, that was seeking the flourishing of the community, which we believe also is a biblical principle. It's found in Jeremiah 29, verse 7. Seek the peace and the welfare of this city. Now, if that had continued and we had become convinced that the government was forbidding us to worship the Lord, it wasn't just about for a period of time, don't gather in large gatherings, but if if we really believed that we were being forbidden from worshiping God Himself, then I think our response would have changed. Now, that doesn't mean that we automatically would have just thumbed our nose at at the government and opened up our doors and said, hey, come on in, and we're all going to get arrested, and it's going to be wonderful. I don't know that it would have looked like that. That would have been a very Western response. I mean, that's, that's kind of the way we as Americans do things. But if you think about it, there are many other ways to, to not obey a worldly decree. I think about the way that Christians in China have done this for years and years and years. They have not built big buildings and, and defied the government by having big worship service. They have just found other ways to worship under the radar. Let me ask you a question. Where do you think the church of Jesus Christ is growing faster today, in the United States or in China? See, we have a tendency to think the way that you exercise your freedom looks one way. Well, guess what? Civil disobedience can look other ways. And sometimes it's even more effective other ways. It's also interesting to me that in Exodus chapter 1, verse 12, I I tried to emphasize this a little bit when I read it to you, but we're told that even in the midst of all of this oppression, all of this hard, forced labor for the Israelites, guess what? The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. We do not have to be free of oppression in order to build the kingdom of God. I'm not saying, let's look forward to that, let's get excited about that. I'm just saying, that is not a requisite. That's not a prerequisite. It's not a requirement for God working. And that really brings us to the second takeaway. No one can mess up your life. Not you, not me, not the government. No one can mess up your life. If Pharaoh hadn't tried to eliminate the male Israelite children, Moses would not have been prepared the way that he was. If, if, if Pharaoh had not given this decree that all of the males born into among the Israelites would be killed, then Moses would not have been prepared in the Egyptian culture because he just would have stayed a slave and he never would have been educated. And 
Think about this. If Moses had, we haven't gotten to this part really yet, but if Moses had not blown it in this confrontation with the Egyptian who was abusing the Hebrews and he killed him and he, you know, hit him in the sand, I'm not saying that what Moses did was, was right there. Moses blew it. But if he hadn't blown it, then he would not have gone into the next chapter of his preparation to be the deliverer of God's people, which is what we're going to look at next week, which is where he next spends the next 40 years of his life doing what? Almost nothing. In his mind, now we're going to see it wasn't nothing. God was doing something, and it was part of his preparation, and it was the essential part of his preparation. But Moses never would have desired it, and he never would have chose it. Here's the point. In Psalm 57, verses 1 and 2, the psalmist says, Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for my life. Do you realize that the psalmist is using the phrase, the storms of destruction, and the phrase, fulfilling your purpose in my life, in the same sentence? We don't do that, do we? We say, the storms of destruction in my life are things I want out of, and God's purposes for my life, that's what I want. But the thought that the storms of destruction and God's purpose in my life might go together is not a very comfortable thought for us. But that's what the psalmist is saying. This very idea is echoed in the New Testament in Romans 8.28, which we love to quote. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that if you love God, everything's going to go great. What it means is if God is in your life and you belong to Him, then He is working every detail of your life together according to His purpose, which is good. What this means is that we can let go of our agenda and we can trust God with our lives because He has a plan. This is what it means for us to stop trying to be the Lord of our own lives and to trust Him to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. There are times when your circumstances are going to make you feel like your life is over. When things happen in your life that you would not have planned, you would not have chosen, you didn't see coming, and you say, this is terrible, my life is over. There are times when following the Lord makes you feel like, if I obey God, my life's going to be ruined. We've left Moses here today sitting on a rock in the desert. I'm sure he is feeling like his life is over. But Moses only became the deliverer of his people because he was rejected. And like Moses, Jesus only became the deliverer of his people because he was rejected. Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. When you find yourself, when I find myself feeling like my life is over. My hopes and dreams are in ruins. Know that your story isn't over. God is doing something. Don't turn back. Trust in God. Say to God, thy will be done. Let's pray.
Lord, we don't know what the future holds, but you do. We don't know what the future holds for our lives individually. We don't know what the future holds for this society in which we live today. But you are the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And you have a purpose. And your purpose is good. And it will be completed. Lord, we don't know how we fit into it. We know how you've called us to fit into it, that we are your ambassadors. As if you are making your appeal through us, you've given us a message, a gospel, that, that calls people to come to you and experience your grace and your mercy and your loving kindness. That you sent your son, the rightful king, and he became, he became our servants. He gave his life for us. But he is now seated at your right hand. And his name is above every other name. Lord, you are worthy of our trust. Our circumstances, we don't know. But you are worthy of our trust. Help us to trust you. To surrender to you. To obey you. To surrender to your authority. May your kingdom come. May your will be done here on earth, even as it is in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.